You ready? I didn't put shoes on. Is that gonna make me feel weird? Maybe. Why do you need to have shoes on? No, let me get my shoes on. <laughs> okay, wait. What? Why do you need to have shoes on? Because I feel naked without them. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Patrick Jager. Hi, and I'm T. Ferguson. Welcome to another episode of The Distillery. So today, we're going to uh, hit something that is all over the headlines. It's bombarding the creative communities, and that is consolidation. Yeah, in fact, we have one of our guests today, Evan Shapiro, who has built a media universe map. And I'm going to guess that it probably has to be updated on a weekly basis. Absolutely, it does. We'll hold off and talk to him about that in our two-on-one segment. But for now, let me remind you how this works. We have three rounds. The first is our now round. Uh, and that is really kind of talking about where we are in our communities now and over the last couple years. The second is a 211 deep dive. And this time we're going to be talking with Evan about all things, his background and how he became the ultimate media cartographer who can claim that they're a cartographer. And then we have our next round, which is kind of predictions into the future. But as always, we start with a poll. Well, but not as always. Um, this time we're going to change it up a little bit. Uh, we we normally wanted to have some sort of data point or stat that's apropos to the to the conversation. Um, but in all honesty, we've had a really hard time um, finding stats that were not almost immediately out of date because of the ever changing landscape of what's going on. And uh, for this episode, we've asked the guests to come to us with the stat that they find the most interesting. Um, and I'm sure they're going to be stronger than ours. But our stat is in 1983, there were almost 50 dominant media corporations. Today, there are five. These five conglomerates own about 90% of the media in the United States, including newspapers, magazines, book publishers, motion picture studios, music labels, and radio and television stations. Considering that we talk about the greater creative community, that is a big chunk of creativity yeah. being held by five people. Crazy. It, it, it makes me nervous. I remember the days when I started in the industry of like having to draw the maps myself, a la what Evan's doing trying to understand who worked where. But I honestly, it, right now, I mean, the way things have consolidated, these maps have, have shrunk. And the, the people that work in these departments, um, these departments are gone. And uh, all of the redundancies that are happening, it, it's it's really fascinating, but also a little, a, little, a little scary. And I'm curious to know what our guests are thinking about all of it. We might get into the kind of people equation of this whole world, but yeah, to your point, you know, I talked to a lot of people that were our peers and a lot of them were over us in our industries and our companies that you and I both worked for. And um, they're scrambling. Yeah. And they're competing against 20 other people that we've known for. Yeah. And what is their future? Like what, what sort of growth now is possible when these companies are all so small? I mean, everybody knows that in, in, in our industry, like you just jump from network to network to network <laughs> um, and people have done it. They've made careers out of it. And now that, I mean, that's like, first of all, is that ever a good idea? But also, is it even possible anymore? Well, everybody one. I, I mean, I think the thing, I think the thing that, that, that's scary is, is when you were in the cable industry or the linear television or just the film entertainment industry, you could go from Bravo to BET to HGTV to Sundance and the genre might be a little different, but the theory is the same. Right. But now you're going from, you know, you're going from NBC Universal to Twitch to Amazon to Roku, and those aren't translatable skills. No, very different. Well, that's our stat, and that's our our um, very uplifting conversation. Sorry, everybody, but uh, we're here today to hear from three amazing people that have brought their stats and their brilliance to this topic. Uh, so let's start introducing them. First, I want to introduce and welcome Anjali Mita, uh, co-founder and CEO of Diesel Labs, a content analysis company that addresses the toughest questions facing media companies today. What to produce and where to distribute it. 
Before starting Diesel, she was the global director of media research at Twitter, which she joined via the acquisition of Bluefin Labs, the pioneer in social TV analytics. Prior to Bluefin, she was VP of strategy and analytics at Digitas. Significant resume. Um, it just sounds like you're very important. Anjali, <laughs> welcome. I just really like to watch TV. So <laughs> navigated my way into the perfect job. <laughs> now, if you can only do that and analyze it at the same time, that'd be great. But I forgot your fun fact. So your fun fact, and I can relate to this fun fact, um, as a kid, you used to watch and tape everything so you wouldn't miss the twists and turns of any of your favorite shows, uh, and especially The X-Files. Yes, I'm I'm a proud X-Files fan. And I was when I was growing up, I was very young, and they're pretty complicated storylines, lots of arcs and characters. And so it st I started at an early age. That's all I'll say. <laughs> I love it. And, and your stat that you would like to bring to the table today is? So I thought I would share with you guys, we've actually just uh, begun putting together a, a media landscape report actually here at Diesel Labs. And one of the neat things we're learning is that Disney right now for the past 18 months has had about 13% of all of the titles that have been released. And yet they have 25% of all of the engagement within all of the social and video platforms. Netflix, on the other hand, has a very different strategy. They have just under 30% of all the titles, yet only about 13% of the engagement. So just a really interesting way to compare and contrast the different strategies that these different massive media companies are taking as they figure out their path forward. Oh, consolidation. All right. <laughs> Next, uh, we are honored to be joined by CEO and president and founder of ACF Investment Bank, Thomas Day, coming to us live from London. ACF specializes in selling, buying, fundraising, and pre and post deal services for business in, in intellectual property, content creation, and international distribution. They've advised on transactions with a combined value of over $5 billion. And uh, deals we've heard of that he's been a part of have included the sales of Bear Grylls, Left Bank, Magical Elves, and A. Smith, just to name a few. Um, Thomas, your fun facts. Um, so you uh, have had COVID, not once, hmm, but twice, which is a little triggering. <laughs> How are you? How are you doing? <laughs> well, I, I also had my jab on Monday, and I can tell you categorically, I now feel like I've had it three times. Oh, no. Um, because it was like an instant transportation device straight back to my last time. Um, but now I'm fighting fit and. Uh, I'm slightly less extravagant in my uh, claim that you can't catch COVID more than once. <laughs> Glad you're doing well. We're, we're happy to have you. <laughs> Literally. Um, what, uh, what stat did you bring? I'm interested in the global spend um, that's happening in the content space. And each week I'm seeing a new number coming out. And this week they announced a new number of 220 billion being spent on global spend next year. And this is due to rise to 260 billion um, by 2026, you know, that is a quarter of a trillion being spent on our space and the space that we all love and fish in. So I think that's just very exciting because it's the driving force behind all this consolidation and behind all the excitement and behind all the growth in every part of this sector. So I think this is going to be, you know, one of the most exciting periods in content we've ever seen. Last but certainly not least is Evan Shapiro, who will be joining us for our two-on-one segment as well. Over the past 30 years, Emmy and Peabody award-winning Mr. Shapiro has worked in media, entertainment, and education, creating distinctive content, building iconic brands, teaching thousands of students and young executives, leading a charge for diversity and inclusion in media, and pushing for change in the industry as an executive, producer, board member, professor, writer and thought leader. That sounds grandiose, but I, for one, have followed Evan for a long time because he is all those things. He's also incredibly honest, uh, and I love that. Evan, welcome. It's Thanks, great to have you here. Thank you very much. You read uh, that quite well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your fun fact, uh, didn't graduate from college, and you have been arrested not once, but thrice. Yes. So I dropped out of college, but I now teach at two different colleges, which I like. And I was arrested three times, uh, once for uh, driving with a suspended license, once for selling marijuana, which I wouldn't be arrested for today, and once for shutting down Times Square for a protest. 
Those are good things. Yeah. Were they all on the same day? Yeah. It was like, <laughs> it was a rocking Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> what is the stat you're bringing today? So my stat, uh, I've mapped the media landscape and I just recently mapped the gaming landscape and I'm in the process of mapping the connected television landscape. Hmm. And so the stat that I come is kind of multifaceted. So everybody talks about the power of Roku and Fire, right? Um, but they each represent less, uh, about 6% each of all connected TV devices on Earth. Samsung, who's the giant, represents about 14% of all connected television on Earth. Um, 40% of the smart televisions on Earth are unaffiliated with a major operating system that you have ever heard of. And the thesis that I'm building is that the war for that 40% is actually going to be one of the big battles in the looming media wars. That, all right, so that's fascinating. Um, but we are gonna start with our now round. Um, and this is really talking about where we are today as an industry, where we are today collectively in our thoughts, so we're gonna start with something that is maybe a softball, maybe a hardball, I don't know. What's your POV into this consolidation world? Yeah, I mean, I, I could not agree more, um, Evan, with your with your uh, fact or state of the state, if you will, because I, you know, it's pretty clear right now that we already have battles being waged in terms of content production, right, and consolidation, and that's some of what we're here to talk about. But then the next step is, or the next sort of level up is distribution. And distribution has always sort of been, you know, I would say reasonably well, well, maybe I shouldn't use positive <laughs> adjectives here, but it, you know, we have our cable companies in the United States who had been essentially the arbiter of distribution. And now with people essentially going direct to these, you know, platforms, network streamers are using the Samsung TVs or Roku's to get to their favorite content. That's a whole new, essentially, I think, uh, arena where we're going to see kind of the next battles waged, if you will. Uh, so that's, you know, from our perspective, we already kind of see that happening. I get asked a lot, you know, people, because we're a predictive analytics company. So people often ask, who's going to get bought next? And as much as I wish I had a magical or spot on answer for that, honestly, it's anyone's game. When you look at the fact that you have Apple and Amazon in, in the picture right now uh, with trillions of dollars in the bank, even the next largest media company is in what the two to three hundred billion dollar arena in terms of market cap? It really means, honestly, that any of these companies are on the table. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Roku is hovering somewhere around fifty or sixty billion, which makes them a pretty attractive target, I would say, especially if you're a media company that's trying to figure out where are you going to go when you're, you know, if you've been relying on set-top boxes this long, how are you going to make sure you put a big stake in the ground for that next phase of what media and entertainment will be here in the states? Love it. Thomas, what's your point of view into consolidation? Um, well, I know who's going to be bought next because we're <laughs> going to close the deal tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> so, um, barring that bit of uh, sort of like news. Okay, um, who? <laughs> well, obviously, we have to wait for the press to be released. But um, so, I mean. This is a yeah, safe listen. space, though. This isn't going to come out. <laughs> we're not recording. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we're recording this. Yeah, we're, we're not live. It's okay. Um, so, whereas Anjali relies on you know huge amounts of data and actually looking at the data before speaking, um, we just kind of go out there and use gut feel and intuition based on who we talked to this morning. No, I mean it's a bit more scientific than that, but <laughs> I, I agree with the, the the basic principle that everybody feels undersized in this market. You know, when we get these deals being announced that are seismic, and when MGM goes for 8.45 million, an interesting number. I would have loved that negotiation why it didn't get to 8.5, right? It would have been the final 50 would have gritted everyone's teeth. But, um, you know, 8.45, 8 right? And, and yet a few years ago, that was being touted as a 4 billion asset. So it's doubled in value without having significantly changed the catalog, right? So I think there's a, there's a war between some people with some pretty big wallets, as Anjali said. And I think that as a result, everybody feels underpowered. And for me, that means we're either we're going to get into, and if you look at any market, actually, you don't have to just look at this market, any market that matures, you get into very dominant players and niche players. Um, and at the moment, we're spread out at the moment. 
So I think that mapping exercise is going to get a lot easier. There's going to be five or six big dots, and there's going to be lots of little dots. And when the little dots get interesting, people are going to hoover them up. And that's what we've seen in the marketing and advertising space. That's what we've seen in a bunch of other industries. So I think that's what we're going to see here. And if I have my way, we're going to be part of the process of making that happen. Brilliant. Evan, your turn. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think I call them the trillion dollar Death Stars. One of the thesis that I have for the next 10 years is pretty much everything that happens in the media ecosystem is going to be driven directly by or in relation, to, you know, reaction to those five to seven trillion dollar Death Stars. Facebook just crossed trillion dollars in value yesterday. Um, you know, and, and Mike, don't, don't sell short Microsoft as an influence on this uh, arena as well. Um, I think when you when you talk about who's going to buy Roku, I think Microsoft actually um, is a really good likely um, acquirer of them because they they very much want to be in the living room. They've been making attempts um, to buy TikTok and uh, uh, Pinterest and Discord all in the last uh, ten months to get more and more ingrained into um, the entertainment sphere. Um, plus, they already have gaming. I think it's it's also folly to only focus on TV when you talk or or, or filmed entertainment when you talk about consolidation, um, gaming um, in particular. Um, Facebook's just made a major acquisition of a game company. Um, Apple um, is embroiled in a court case with you know a, another trillion dollar Death Star Tencent um, via Epic over Fortnite. Um, they have Arcade. I think it, as Apple. Let me back up. I'll, I'll make a, a much broader statement. Those five companies, and four of them in particular, are going to face tremendous um, challenges to their business models, primarily from regulation over the next 36 months. Um, Facebook, Google, Apple, and Amazon are all going to face pretty steep regulation. The president of Microsoft yesterday said that the regulation that he expects to come over the next 24 months is akin to what happened in the 30s to the financial sector. So he's comparing big tech today to the companies that caused the Great Depression. And he sees the amount of regulation coming into their business models as, as big as it was in the 1930s. And I, I agree, there are five bills running through Congress right now that are going hard at their businesses. So whether Apple's regulated in the App Store or Alphabet and Facebook are regulated because of their duopoly and their collusion and their duopoly over advertising, they're going to have to change their business models in some way, shape, or form, which I think they'll only really be able to do by acquisition. So I see Apple buying into the gaming business. I see Amazon. They, you know, they've bought two major audio companies in just the last 90 days. So audio is another big sector of consolidation. Um, and I, I think Facebook and Alphabet in particular who are, in the case of Alphabet, 95% advertising business. In the case of Facebook, a 98% advertising business. I think both of them are going to be looking to get into the subscription game and other areas of the business um, to diversify their revenue stream because they're not going to have a choice. Hmm. Um, Evan, I want to make sure that in, in your two-on-one, we, we can dig a little deeper into some of what you're forecasting and what you're looking at. Um, for, for the group as a whole, I think you know, part of this section of the episode is really about the now. And uh, I'm curious as to leading up and all of the things that we've all experienced over the past 16 months through pandemic and Black Lives Matter and everything else, what do you think, um, what do you think has been the biggest surprise to come out of our most recent little bucket of history in terms of consolidation? And has it been affected negatively, positively accelerated? Um, what are your thoughts there? I'm happy to chime in. Yeah. I think one of the things that I was most surprised by is the fact that every single one of our friends in the media space launched their direct-to-consumer or OTT solution basically on time. So we, you know, we entered into a pandemic. We had all these companies who were racing to essentially get their platforms out the door. I mean, if you think about it, before the pandemic, we pretty much Disney Plus and I think Apple TV Plus were the ones that had just launched. All the rest of the ones that we talk about today, so Paramount Plus, Peacock, Discovery Plus, you know, HBO Max, all of these things launched basically in the middle of a pandemic and on time, no less, which 
it, it's not an easy thing to do to launch them in the first place. And then to launch them under trying circumstances, I think tells you how important these launches are to these massive companies that they were able to essentially pull that off. Um, and, you know, of course, there are other decisions that have been made, for example, Warner moving all of their direct, you know, theatrical releases onto HBO Max for at least this calendar year to, to see sort of if they could essentially lighten the load, right? Because they have all of stuff in the can. And there's only so many weekends in 2022 where we can have big blockbuster movies. So those are the things that I look at as, you know, in, a, in an extremely bizarre and unusual year where we all had, we were all going through a lot of stuff. Um, to see to see the media you, you know landscape not only stay on track but actually pick up in terms of velocity has been really interesting. Evan, what about you? What surprised you? I, I continually am surprised at how surprised everybody in my industry is all the time. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, yes, they launched on time, but how did HBO Max and Peacock launch without Fire and Roku? Like, and they were surprised at how disastrous that was for them at launch like that these these are people who come from the television industry distribution is always the first thing you lock in you, you don't launch before you're distributed and the fact that they were surprised by the reactions that they got out of that was surprising um you know yes the the black lives matter movement was i guess surprising to a lot of people but i'm surprised at how surprised they all were like this is not these are not new things. Um, and diversity and inclusion is something that people in my industry talk about a lot and don't often do a lot about. And when you look at on-screen representation, that's actually made a very strong move in the last 24 months, but representation, but for a couple of big high profile things in just the last six months, you know, changes at the very top of the org structure as far as diversity of uh, of color and faith and gender and uh, sexual identity and economic caste um, is almost nil. Uh, you know, some 90 plus percent of, of heads of studios in the entertainment industry are, are, are white and an overwhelming are men. Um, now, again, there have been some very high profile changes almost entirely in reaction to what's happened over the last two years, but I, I wrote a piece in 2012 saying that the pay TV ecosystem was going to lose 40% of its um, subscribers by 2025. We, we beat that by four years. And I just don't see how, I, I still remain incredibly surprised at how surprised this industry is at things that are just very obviously coming at, over the horizon at them all the time. You know, I wonder how much of that is surprise versus, um, myopic don't rock the boat we know but we know we know we know but let you know let someone else deal with that i mean that's kind of how our whole world works right sadly yes i mean a lot of it is like uh, you know if i can just get to 65 i can retire i guess but then they right. don't, none of them ever fucking retire so like what like if you really want you know bob Iger was the most bold of all the ceos when it came to streaming um, after Netflix, obviously, um, you know, they, he planted his flag super early. He said, we're going to lose $25 billion doing it. Um, and since the day that he announced that we're going to lose 20, we, we, he said it proudly, we're going to lose $25 billion getting into streaming. Their market cap has more than doubled since that point. And they had a shitty year last year and it's still more than doubled um, over that time. Nobody else has had, none of the other big conglomerates have done nearly as much in saying, yes, we're proudly going to lose this much money on this enterprise. And it, as a result, their stock prices have suffered in comparison to, to Disney's over that same period of time. I just, there are examples being set all the time. And yet these folks who run these companies who make ungodly sums of money um, don't seem to take the bait on really good case studies that they could just emulate if they chose. Hmm. I mean, I can second the motion on that because we are very 
lucky and we get to work with folks who all you know on the traditional media side or the the old school side if you will as well as the the new folks who are coming in from the tech company side or who have you know leadership telling them this is an important charter for our company and basically pushing that message throughout um you know all of the the rank folks who are making the day-to-day kind of minutia decisions and you know i get asked very different questions from those two cohorts so for example on the traditional media side, we get asked the same questions that frankly have been asked for the last five years. Things like, you know, who's my audience? What can I learn about them? You know, can you tell me sort of basic uh, type information? Whereas when when we talk to the players in the more advanced spaces, the OTT folks, they're like, we don't need your models. We want all of your raw data. We're going to plug it into our own predictive models. And we're going to use this to basically better understand how the world is working. And that if that isn't a signal, I think, Evan, that supports some of what you're saying, then I don't know what is because, you know, I'll try to go knock on the doors of some of these other companies and say, hey, guys, you know, this is what we're doing over here. It, maybe there's something we should be discussing. Um, this may be something we should be thinking about. But frankly, the, the appetite and also the, the understanding isn't quite there yet. You know, on the one hand, you're working with 60 Uh, data science PhDs. And on the other hand, you're working with folks who basically grew up in the media industry and certainly no, no ding meant in, in, on that at all. It's just very, very different talent, very different people supporting the initiatives. And, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see which of the traditional companies embrace this sort of new world and understand that they're going to have to kind of become tech companies from the inside out in order to continue to succeed. And but there and Thomas could probably talk about this then better than I can. But the ones who act like tech companies get better valuation. <laughs> Stock market treats them better as a result. And so you would think they would th- say like Netflix has never been profitable, and yet their stock is worth more than Comcast. Let's act more like a tech company. I, I still don't get it. And I mean, I've come from a tech company myself, and I can say that, you know, it's not all, <laughs> you know, roses over there either. There's, there, the, these, these companies have the opportunity right now to say, hey, we're going to embrace these pieces. We're going to do these parts that we know really well, and maybe we're not going to do this other thing that now we, you know, because we have the benefit of seeing companies, you know, these tech companies grow up and make mistakes, and that's completely okay. Um, so they could leapfrog if they wanted to, because they also have the vault, right? They have the vaults of content. They have just this innate decades old understanding of how to build content that people want to see. And yet they're, you know, I think to a certain degree, maybe falling behind, it might be sounding a little dramatic, but it's what it looks like. Even Let let me, let let me go back, Anjali, and answer a question you were saying earlier about everyone launching on time, because again, with the gut intuition, but no science, um, I think it's a little bit like ice cream sellers in Canada right now. Um, you know, they've gone, holy shit, let's get out of here, right? I mean, we're going to launch a platform. We're going to launch a streaming platform to people at home. And there's a pandemic and everybody's locked in their living room. Can you imagine the guy who would say, sorry, we're delayed by six months, eight months. We can't quite make that window, right? It was the most fertile launch time in the history of the last hundred years. So I think anybody who said this isn't ready yet was probably fired on the spot, right? But Quibi <laughs> is an example of where, you know, we could talk about that later, but that's a good example of where things maybe didn't stay on the rails as well as they should have. When, when, there's, when there's a surging wave, some people get drowned by it, right? <laughs> they're, having, they're not ready for that bigger wave to come. It's sure. only the bigger players that come. Um, so let me answer the question. I mean... The thing that surprises me is much more macro, which is we've had 12 to 16 months of global interruption of the entire economic system. And every single person I'm talking to, every lawyer, every banker, every valuation expert, every accountant is backlogged with work. They've never been as busy as they currently are. And you know, if you go back five years ago, if there was a 2% decline in China output, the whole, all of all the economies collapsed around the world. And instead, we've had this massive interruption to the whole global supply of finance. And everyone's gone, ah, that doesn't matter. <laughs> let's look forward. Let's not look backwards. Let's just pretend that didn't happen. And 
I just can't believe the number of deals being done. I can't believe the economic activity. I can't believe the stock market. I can't believe the general. We should be in a 1930s recession. We should be queued up for bread. And instead, people are like, great, let's do more and more stuff. Now, I know it's a tale of two halves, and I don't think everybody's in that good camp at all. I think it's very sort of segregated into two different camps. But I can't understand the camp that's doing really well. I don't, I don't, I mean, Evan, you teach this stuff, you know, Angela, you've got this evidence at your fingertips, that the news, but please tell me why are things so good in that segment? They're not, is the answer. So the people at the very top of that, of that segment are doing incredibly well. They're very optimistic. They're pedal to the metal um, and all that great stuff. The people in the lower two thirds of that segment are miserable and they report that they're going to quit. Um, they're thinking of changing careers. They don't believe that their boss gets it. There's a great study by Microsoft that just came out uh, about 10 days ago and they, and they surveyed all their team's users. And there's this, comp I mean, it is the tale of two cities. It, 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 the, the, the story at the top and the story at the bottom. And by top, I mean the top third versus the bottom two thirds. It couldn't be more different. There are 10 million people out of work in the United States. There are 9 million open jobs. Um, and, and the people who are out of work are not looking to go back. And the reason that there's this misperception that these $300 checks that Joe Biden sent are the reason they're not going back to work. Absolutely not to the truth. A lot of them can't go back to work because they can't get childcare. Mm -hmm. A lot of them won't go back to work because they don't believe that their companies value them at all. And a lot of them are going to either change careers or basically wait, because right now Chipotle just raised their minimum pay. McDonald's is about to raise their minimum pay. Walmart is about to raise their minimum pay. Amazon just raised their minimum pay. The, the global pandemic is going to create one of the greatest readjustments of worker pay probably in the since the Industrial Revolution, at least, if not in all of kind of uh, uh, work history. Because yeah. the workers are tired. They're not, to, to quote a great song, I'm mad at, or a great movie, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And then to quote a song, take this job and shove it. They are revolting. And it's, it work, it's going to create inflation. And it's probably a necessary readjustment because, and I know this is not about the media, but it is also about the media. People don't feel that they have to take shitty jobs for no pay. I think that one of the things that we, one of the reasons that T and I started this was so many of our friends across the creative communities were saying, what the heck are we going to do now? You know, there is this, this is pre the, we're not going to go back to work anymore. And, you know, I lost two thirds of my clients during the, uh, during the pandemic. My husband was furloughed for nine months. You know, our son had to move back in. Uh, my, my anxiety meds tripled, but I think that, I think that what we've, what we've learned is, um, you know, the, to your point, there's a lot of anger or ambivalence towards those at the top that just keep these deals going because that's the only way they can stay in business in their mind, Thomas, I think to your point. Um, and everyone underneath them, I, I've talked, I talked to two GMs last week that both are about to give notice. I, I won't say who, um, but like, you know, and that's the GM level. I know, you know, T and I talk about it all the time, all of our friends that are VPs and SVPs and EVPs that are all like, I'm done. I'm in this for the paycheck. And if the second they tell me well, I have to come back in the office, I'm out. Yeah. So, so there is a really interesting, and we're, we're at a we're really interesting inflection point for sure. Yeah. I mean, and the, even speaking of consolidation, we've seen, you know, Warner shrunk by almost, I think, 20%, right, towards the end of last year. And who knows what's going to happen when Warner and Discovery finally <laughs> make that that final union. There's probably going to be more. $3 billion in synergy savings. I mean, okay, so there you go. How many people? Yeah. yeah, how many people is that basically? And then you have the same thing where Disney let go of a lot of people. I mean, NBCU let go of a lot of people. You have, you have all these major companies and kind of, Evan, to your point about the kind of the lower third, it's like, I wouldn't call them necessarily the lower third. These were very highly compensated people, very skilled people, especially in the world of traditional media. The challenge is, is that those jobs, they're not going to come back the way we know them, right? Like, we're not going to have a traditional ad sales job for thousands of people anymore in the marketplace because 
now half the content that everybody wants is behind paywalls. So then now you have to go to the Roku bottle or the Samsung. This kind of brings us back full circle to what we were talking about in the beginning. And because a lot of that's more addressable, the whole nature of how ad sales is going to work is, is completely changing. So you have these folks who, you know, we talk, I think in politics, we talk a lot about like retraining coal miners, but there's kind of a retraining media professionals to a certain extent when all this consolidation happens is because, you know, if you, if you know how to do things the way that it was done two or more years ago, it's, it's night and day on the other side of, of where we're looking now into the future. Um, the way that things are being done with algorithms and models and data science, it's, it's not at all about, oh, I need to go get a 2% bump from my person at Toyota. It's yeah, the, the, that's gone. Just think about all the people in marketing. I mean, and uh, Angela, you probably deal a lot with that, that group. So in, in traditional media, marketing departments, at, at, other than programming, and actually often instead of programming, the marketing department's the largest department. Of, of these channel brands. Yeah. None of those people understand growth marketing at all. And the only thing that matters on a moving forward basis is growth marketing. Um, brand marketing is almost pointless. I mean, Netflix does, I don't think, has Netflix ever done a brand campaign? I don't think they've ever done a brand campaign in the history of the company. It's all growth. I mean, their brand campaigns like they did last December was the we're going to have a new blockbuster movie every weekend next year. Or it's, honestly, or it's, it was a little bit of a reaction to the HBO Max news. Right. So even the idea of a brand campaign has shifted, it, it, you know. I want to switch this to um, because I think it plays off of this, this idea of regret. You know, we talked a little bit about the regret of getting in late. I was at NBC Universal working with ad sales and uh, the people that then ultimately created uh, Peacock right before the pandemic. And, you know, it was very clear that it was the tail wagging the dog. And, you know, what analytics were they looking at? Uh, did, were they doing due diligence in the right way in the things that they were buying? Um, did they look to see if it could join or if it would become cumbersome and com problematic? So Thomas, I'm gonna open this up to you first. What are what do you think out of this last big round are some of the regrets, or do you see you know things that you don't think people did the right type of due diligence before they did? I would have said uh, pretty much you know what Anjali was commenting on in terms of everybody launching their platforms at the same time. I think some of the smaller players could have delayed their streaming platforms you know so that they didn't run up against you know, the big scrabble of big players coming to market. Um, so I think a few of them, as Evan said, a few of them were not in the right shape to do it, um, but they did it because my earlier comment about ice cream, I think they just felt it was a necessity. But I think being first is not always the right place and being in the right shape is, is a better place to be. So I think there's a few heads that probably got knocked together there. I'm glad you didn't ask me about my regrets because I was like <laughs> I was scrabbling around with a lot of personal thoughts there. Um, probably having COVID twice was probably one of my regrets, but um, yeah. <laughs> Where I, am. I, I want to be careful because, you know, you all have client relationships. I don't want you to script your client relationships, but I'm sure there are at least a deal or two that all of us have been part of that you went, mm, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but good luck. I mean, I think it, I, you know, obviously won't speak to a specific deal that maybe went off the rails, but in general, one of the trends that we, that I'm seeing a lot of is shows and content getting canceled from the linear space. And then some of it being anointed by the OTT cohort, getting popped onto platforms like Netflix or Amazon or what have you, and getting an entirely new life breathing into them, right? You wonder why, for example, like take Manifest, which the timing of that was just so curious where it's getting canceled off NBC yet trending number one on Netflix in the United States, literally on the same day. And you're, you know, you, it does make you wonder like what's under the hood of that? Why wouldn't Manifest in theory go to Peacock? There must be really good reasons for all of this. And I have faith in, in I have faith in, in, you know, in some of those decision makers. But when you think about consolidation and regrets, I think, you know, we've talked about this a little bit. And I guess if I can recap kind of what we're all what we're all saying is like, look, everything launched on time, maybe not perfectly. But then the tail wagging the dog situation is, well, there's no three to five year content strategy right now outside of maybe the, the biggest players. 
how is that going to hurt these guys in the long run when they're trying to build up their subscriber base? It's like, how do you start a platform without 10,000 hours of amazing content, right? So just the, the, the bare necessity to even compete, uh, we're starting to see sort of what that looks like. And I think, if anything, I think that the regrets are going to be around probably not moving fast enough or aggressive enough and making the statement of, hey, we're going to lose $25 billion, but we're going to make sure that if someone's paying $7.99 or $9.99 for our service, that there's always something there for them to watch. Because right now, I don't think that's always necessarily true on every single one of the platforms. I want to keep an eye on time for everybody, and, and we want to get into the to the two-on-one with Evan. Obviously, Evan, you know, we want to dive into you as cartographer and your map and what you're building and how you're visualizing all of this, um, but also super curious about your about how you got here and your backstory. And so you have the floor for a moment. Fill us in, catch us up. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I want to, I want to tag on the, the regret thing. I mean, everything at and No, that's, that's just the answer to that question. There is really no other answer to that question. They set a hundred <laughs> billion dollars on fire through two acquisitions, both of which failed horrifically. They are the Hindenburg of media companies. Um, how do I get here? You know, I, uh, I got fired a couple of times <laughs> um, and got paid to get fired, which is nice. Um, you know, I, I, I worked at, uh, I, I started IFC and Sundance Channel. I helped make that acquisition of Sundance Channel back then. I got to run both channels and learn a lot. Um, and then I said to my company back then, look, everything's going OTT. We should take Sundance Channel OTT. I don't understand why we don't. And this was 2011 and nobody had the appetite to do it. Um, and so I left and went on a big walkabout. First at Participant Media where I tried to build an OTT platform there and they still wanted to keep one foot in linear. Uh, and then to NBC, where I did their first direct to, uh, streaming, uh, direct to consumer streaming business, and then they lost their nerve. Um, and now we're literally just kind of redoing everything I did while I was there. Um, and then since then, I've been taking the things I learn as I watch the world turn and burn and turn them into thoughts out loud on the internet all the time. Um, and as a result of that, this map I built on, on uh, uh, mapping the media universe, which is really just, again, it's, a, it's just like taking the surprise out of what's about to happen. This is the size of the companies that are involved in the media wars. There are five of them that are worth five times as much of all the other companies. Gee, what's going to happen? I wonder. And when you look at the map that way, it's kind of all becomes pretty obvious as to where the direction everything's headed. Um, and in just putting my thoughts out there on an ongoing basis, um, so much opportunity has come my way as a result of it. Um, it's been really kind of interesting and gratifying to play the kind of Scott Galloway card, and I'm not comparing myself to him by any stretch of the imagination, but to be able to, to actually sit back and watch what's happening and comment on it, not being inside of it, you, you are taken, you are seen as more credible um, from the outside than you ever will be seen from the inside. Um, and that's enabled me to, to now come up with a whole new career in cartography, uh, mapping different parts of the media universe, uh, teaching at two different universities, um, consulting in a way that I really all have always wanted to, which is less about, you know, make me a, a wicket and more, let's talk about whether or not we should make wickets. Um, and, and that's been incredibly gratifying, but at the same time, I've also, I'm producing a series of films, I'm producing a bunch of podcasts, I'm doing a tremendous amount of writing, uh, I just announced that I'm doing a mobile comic as an NFT um, and I'm writing it, which is a lot of fun. And I had to learn what an NFT was in order to understand whether that was a good idea or not. Um, and so it's, it's honestly, I think at the next big wave, there's going to be two major, two major chunks of the media economy. There's going to be the trillion dollar guest star platform portal app world driven by companies like Amazon and Disney and Netflix. And there's going to be the creator economy half um, that I think is going to explode. And I find myself more and more in the creator economy end of the business. 
and I'm enjoying it more and more. I actually, I, I was speaking to some wealth managers who were sort of looking at a portfolio of investments. And I was talking about the dominance of the fangs and how they were growing and being the, the players. And how I wanted to place some money in that whole world. And they, they gave me a graph that showed each of the top 10 companies for the last decade, going back like five decades. And they pointed out that each of those companies didn't exist in the following decade in the top 10 companies. And I kind of just disagreed with that and felt that sufficient momentum had been sort of created by, as you're calling them, the death stars. I, I call them beloved buyers. Um, you know, and, and I just wonder, is that same thing going to happen in the next decade? Or have they had so much of a head start that they'll still survive that and dominate? I think at least one of them will continue to exist. And I think the company to bet on is Amazon. I would never bet against Amazon. They have the greatest corporate fraud flywheel in, in history. And every time you think they can't find a new business, they find a new business and they're successful in it. I mean, they, they have just barely scratched the surface of the value of Twitch, for example. Like just, they're just starting to realize, and it's the largest live streaming platform on the planet. So I think they're an easy bet. I think, I'm not saying that these companies are going to go away. Um, and I think Microsoft's another good company, but I think Google and Facebook are facing real problems. I, I, I would be very surprised if they are as dominant 10 years from now as they are today. Apple, it's hard to bet against Apple, but they are still very, 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 very reliant on one product. And that scares me, to be honest with you. I, I, I would take a hard look at NVIDIA I think NVIDIA is the next trillion dollar company. I think Disney is the next trillion dollar company, which is odd because they're not they're hardly a disruptor, but they have a flywheel. Like they their parks department is parks department, their parks division is so important to who they are. And live entertainment is only going to get more important. And the level of IP that they have is unparalleled in human history. And I think when you look at companies like Roblox, um, or uh, OnlyFans, um, or Cameo, or Patreon, or Fireside. When you look at the gaming universe right now, it's dominated by a couple of major players. But there's this movement towards the metaverse, um, which is Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, these heavily immersive, con supposedly persistent, always on, immersive, unified, synchronous experiences, none of which are any of those things. They're not synchronous. They're not persistent. They, they, they don't do anything that a metaverse is supposed to do when that phrase was invented in the book Snow Crash. Roblox is the closest, but the, 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 the 14, 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds who are, who are immersed on these platforms who are making money making games for Roblox, they have such a different point of view of the world. As different as Mark Zuckerberg saw the world from everyone who came before him, there's a generation of Gen Z right now slouching towards Bethlehem to be born who are going to reinvent media from the bottom up and they give zero fucks about the rules. And so I do think I wouldn't say all five of those Death Stars will be out of the, the top companies over the, the next 10 years, but I don't think all five of them will be here then. And I think there are there are smaller companies that are going to merge that overtake them. So I had a bunch of questions to ask you and you very intuitively already answered them before I could ask them. So fully on you, but that means it's time for me to figure out a new question. I think the question for me is what's the level set? You know, we, we have these expectations of these crazy profit margins and these crazy salaries and these, you know, I have, as an, as an anecdote, over the last several years, really adjusted what my expectation is on professional entertainment salary, but I'm so much happier. As we see this shift away from business as usual, do you think that there's going to have to be a re-level set on the expectation side? Yes, yes, and and it is much more entrepreneurial in its in its nature. The the you you can't expect to make five hundred thousand dollars a year 
in a phony baloney job, barely knowing what you're doing and, and expect that to just continue to trundle along. As Angela said, retraining yourself is going to be table stakes in this new economy. Like you you have to keep retraining yourself. And if you don't, if you refuse to do that, then you're not gonna be able to keep pace. That said, those who do, the, the number of small businesses started in the last six months is off the charts, even higher than, than prior to the pandemic. And I think, you know, the reason that is, is self-control and people, you know, that that's definitely a part of it. But I also think that the other part of it is the great dream of like, I'm going to build a billion dollar company. And guess what? You can, <laughs> it is possible. Um, and, and you, and, and the, and the overheadness uh, requirements and the, and the, and the infrastructure requirements to build a billion dollar company aren't Roblox does it like they don't have a game design department <laughs> their game design department is their user base <sighs> that's crazy town they paid 230 million dollars to creators last year they're going to pay a half a billion dollars to creators this year and that's not overhead that's rev share so i do think that the recalculation is around one that is i get a guaranteed paycheck to one that is I have equity in this and I'm getting a rev share. And the more we all succeed, the more we all succeed. And I know that sounds kumbaya, but that's very much where we're headed. It, and OnlyFans and Roblox and Clubhouse and Fireside and all these companies, their entire business model, Roblox, you know, you talked about Roku being a $50 billion company. Roblox is a $50 billion company. And they they did so on the backs of an open source creator community. That's kind of miraculous. And I, Nvidia, who's now worth four hundred uh, billion dollars, on their way to a trillion dollars, they have this thing called the Omniverse, which is an open source um, game uh, collab, you know, creation uh, platform for game creators and and video makers. Um, uh, Unreal Engine is the game is the kind of uh, landscape generation machine inside um, inside Fortnite. It is now, that engine is the sets of Mandalorian. Like when you watch Mandalorian, that's not shot in front of a green screen, that's shot in front of a real time scenery generation machine powered by the game engine that was created for Fortnite. That's crazy town. And it's gonna change filmmaking forever. There's like, it won't be the same. And the cost of making one of those big epic films is actually gonna come down, not go up as a result of that. Cause it's gonna take less time. It's gonna take fewer people to do it. And so, so like the sooner you get around the idea that no one is smarter than everyone and that open source is the future of where we're headed from a content standpoint, it's, that's gonna be a very difficult thing for a lot of people to grapple with. But when they do, you can then set your expectations around how that works. Well, we're clearly now into the next. So moving ahead, Thomas, to you, uh, assuming you agree with the thesis that, you know, the the, the, the climate will change and we're going to all have to reevaluate what we do. What are you advising your clients as the next in terms of consolidation or media or tech as a whole? So, I mean... <clears throat> I think Yuval Harari said it, and he said it very well, which is he talks about this kind of retraining, accelerating, otherwise you join the useless class is what he calls it, which is you know quite abrupt and rude, but it kind of demonstrates the point. And I would add that he puts uh, Uber drivers and investment bankers in the same box. So apparently I'm gonna be joining them in, in speed. Um, I mean, my, my advice to my clients is probably not the advice you'd expect. It's more of a kind of personal happy happiness kind of advice, which is you can't bet against everything that's ever going to happen. So when you get to a place where you're comfortable with what you can get, and that is what you want, get it. And if, if you're not there yet, play in the game until you get there. But don't keep trying to bet against what might happen in the future versus what's happening now. So... I always tell my clients, you know, work at it backwards. Always work backwards is a, 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 a sort of thesis. What do you want and how long does it take you to get there? And that's what you should do. And really ignore everything else. I mean, you know, there's going to be good markets and bad markets. And I think that things are going to happen that are going to happen. But I, I tell my clients within that ecosystem, that's selling. 
buying, I say, forget organic growth, buy, buy, buy. Why would you grow organically and risk multiple years missing out on potential targets like we've just talked about with Amazon? You can buy these assets, grow them, and do something with them, right? Don't rely on organic strategy. It's too slow in today's environment. There's cheap debt, there's cheap investment money. Go out and buy the things you want to add to the portfolio and get there quicker. I'll, I'll pose a question to the group, sort of like uh, quick answer style, but n- next big area of consolidation, what's your what's your prediction? I mean, I think in terms, I frankly, I, this might not be groundbreaking and I don't think it is, but I, I don't think we've seen the end of consolidation within media right now. I think there's a lot more going to happen. And we kind of talked about this at the beginning that it's not going to be just limited to content. I think the entire essentially value chain going all the way up. We've talked about, you know, how NBCU, for example, is owned by Comcast, how Warner, at least until now, AT&T. I think there's going to be a lot more shakeups in terms of who wants to own the content because what we're, at least what I, my perspective is, is that we're seeing these sort of walled gardens emerge, right? Where you have Google or you have, uh, you know, your Facebooks of the world. And what they're trying to do is keep people inside the walled gardens for as long as humanly possible. One of the ways to do that is content, is gaming, is these things that we spend lots of our time doing. So the, the way I look at it is I think media is just a, a means to an end right now. We're all, we're all human. We're always going to love sight, sound, and motion, whether that takes the form of a movie or TV show or video game or what have you. And it's just going to be interesting to see what the new value chain looks like. Because right now, the value chain is really about media companies using Evan's lingo for the Death Stars. I think that we're going to see the way that the new, essentially, composition of these companies is going to change pretty dramatically. And I think gaming is a big part of that. I think um, audio is a big part of that. Because any of those things, I don't think the media companies will necessarily have a strong preference whether you're watching something with your eyes, playing something with your hands, listening to something with your ears, as long as you're spending the time within their platform and thus they have the ability to then serve you X number of ad impressions, wherever you might be, that seems to be where things are heading, at least at the moment. I mean, it's it's interesting actually, Evan, because you've just changed one of my lifetime sayings, right? I've been saying this for 25 years and now I need to adjust it. But there are three things that go into making content. There is the writer, there is the on-screen talent, and there is the producer, right? And you can't replace those three things, barring Evan coming in with users coming in and reversing the content. So now I'm going to have to put a four, three and a half at least, right? But they're, writers, we, they're, they're writers at the end of the okay. day. Okay, all right, they're a, they're a part of writers, okay? Um, I think the blackout of advertising that's happened with the streaming world hasn't fully been felt by all the other areas. So we've got 220 billion coming into this space. We've got WPP and all the big advertising agents knowing no one's watching adverts anymore. And I think therefore you can't reach the consumer. So there's a big issue with that. How do you reach the consumer? They're now hidden behind the wall of streaming. You reach it through those three verticals. And I've done a ton of things in the production space. I've sold a hundred production companies. You know, I've spent a lot of time selling these businesses. My bet now is on the other two areas. I think talent and writers is the really exciting area. And I think people are seeing Dwayne Johnson and how much money he can make, right, by monetizing his on-screen presence. But I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think the the combination of talent with brands is just going to explode. And anyone who's a AAA celeb or, or above will adopt brands, will become owners, and those brands, that's the way you reach the consumer. And then I think the writers, let's not forget the writers, they sit in a dark room with a blank piece of paper and they come up with the ideas. And they've earned a lot of money on shows, right? There's some of them, you know, I work with Left Bank, I, I do, I see some of these big, the Crown productions, et cetera, but I think it's the tip of the iceberg. I think they're the people that are gonna really be pulled, probably kicking and screaming out of the, the, the room into the light because people need their ideas. So I'm gonna back on-screen talent and writers. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think uh, just to tag on to what Thomas said, I think the next great advertising uh, arena will be these metaverses, these immersive arenas, Fortnite. I mean, the, how many places do, do Marvel and DC coexist as brands? Fortnite is like the only place. So I do think the, the amount, 
Generation Z doesn't see gaming as competition. They see it as community. They go into these metaverses to hang out, to watch Travis Scott concerts. And so I think, uh, and by the way, you can not only issue them ads in these ecosystems, you can actually sell them products there too, because there's they're fully functioning economies. So I, I, would, I would look for the advertising inventory inside metaverses like Fortnite and Apex Legends and those type of places to be really important. Um, and then don't, un again, Twitch hasn't hit, uh, hasn't hit a billion dollars in revenue yet. And yet it controls 73% of live streaming on any given night. So th I think that's gonna explode as well. So I, I have actually very specific predictions. I think Lionsgate's the next thing to go. I think it's either Netflix or Apple that buys it. I think Disney will buy the remaining part of A&E they don't own, um, they own 50% makes no sense that they only own 50% and they are the only buyer. So I think that that'll happen. I think Univision will go in a relatively near term, um, probably to someone like uh, Google and Apple or uh, uh, Disney. Um, I think EA is gonna get bought by Apple um, because Apple is going to be regulated out of that Apple tax. Last year, Apple generated $12 billion in just their tax on gaming apps just the tax part, $40 billion in total, $12 billion in just takeaway taxes, the toll at the, at the booth. Um, but that's under, that's going to come under attack between now and this time next year. And they're going to have no choice, but to become a publisher. And EA is sitting there looking like a great buy. I think Microsoft's going to buy Twitter. I think Viacom and CBS are going to get sold probably by this time next year. I think either Apple I think Google is a really interesting place that might buy them. I think Roku is going to get bought by either Apple or Microsoft. Um, I think Facebook is going to buy Spotify. Um, you know, if, if you look at the, the major uh, improvements that Google and Facebook made to themselves, they both came through billion dollar acquisitions. In the case of Google, it was YouTube. In the case of Facebook, it was Instagram, both for about $1.5 billion. The hundred billion dollar acquisition is the new billion dollar acquisition, and I think Facebook overpays for Spotify to get itself into the music business and into the into the subscription business. Um, and I think eventually someone's going to buy Netflix. Um, I, I think Google makes a lot of sense for that. I think Apple makes a lot of sense for that. Um, but those are those would be my predictions. So I keep looking at Thomas to see if with any of those predictions, I feel spark <laughs> that gives away a tell. That's why I did so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would you just didn't like say, or anything. I would just like to say one thing. Uh, Evan's, Evan's comments do not constitute investment advice and shares can go up <laughs> as well as down. So please don't, uh, don't, don't uh, hold him to it and I'll give him that disclaimer for free. Thank you very much. <laughs> You should you should be the the, the intelligent sounding disclaimer voice on, on all of Evan's podcast. <laughs> Look, by the way, by the way, just one quick note: mergers and acquisitions do not necessarily mean improvements of market cap in the aftermath. If you look at the market cap of both Warner of AT and T and Discovery since they announced the merger, both are down dramatically. Yep. So, and also. Mergers, mergers don't exist, which I find really funny that half of my world is kind of like made up because yeah, one company is always bigger than the other. So it's always an acquisition, either with shares or cash. So I love that. And actually, it should be called disposals and acquisitions. That would be a better term. <laughs> but unfortunately, nobody likes disposal. It sounds a bit negative. I like it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm yeah, gonna we'll, do a non, we'll do an informal poll. I think you have us here. All right, this is one of those, we could go on for another hour, but we really are kind of time. We promised you guys we'd kept this, keep this short. Um, so I, I wanna say first and foremost, for those of you watching, we will have links to everyone's site, Evan's Media Universe, the uh, Gaming Omniverse, uh, all, all of this information. So you can go and play your own game of who gets snapped up next. It was beyond, and uh, powerful for us to be able to have you here. Yeah, yeah. thank you all so much. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, it was nice to meet you both. Yeah. <laughs> let us let us let us end up by also saying that if if anyone else has a poll that they want to share in our comments uh, or comment on the poll the polls, we'll definitely put up everyone's polls. Please log on to the distillery.live uh, and engage with the, with the community. Um, 
it will be also interesting because by the time this airs, I have a feeling at least one of your predictions will yeah. already happen. Something happen. will already have happened. And, and clearly, Thomas, whatever <laughs> is going to come out like tomorrow um, will mean that half of this is a moot. <laughs> It'll be a very short episode. <laughs> Apple is buying planet Earth. That's basically it. That's just that's, that's all time. It's one, one deal. One and done, is I think they call it, right? <laughs> if, if they can then fix it, that'd be great. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you so, so much for being part of this. We, ho we hope you enjoyed the day. We sure enjoyed it with you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye.